Thank you, Jane, for the introduction and um, good afternoon, everyone. Um, as Jane already mentioned, um, I'll talk about the topic of um, bioplastics. Mm. And it should, I try to move to the next slide. Let's see whether it's going to work or not. Ah, okay, here we go. Um, so I hope at the end of, um, of the next 15 minutes, you are all familiar what bioplastics are, what um, chemicals and which toxicity they contain and to have um, a wider picture of their opportunities and the challenges. Um, but to start with how did we become interested in bioplastics? In our last um, study, which is what you can see here in this publication, we were analyzing petroleum-based as conventional everyday plastics. And we found that the majority of them contains complex and toxic chemical mixtures. So if you're interested in that, I'm not going to talk about that, but there is this uh, there's publication as well as there is a video on the web page of the Food Packaging Forum. Um, and thus we asked ourselves whether bioplastics and um, other plastic alternatives, which are promoted as green or more sustainable, are um, also toxic from a toxicological perspective, safer than conventional plastics. And before I start to, um, to talk about that, I shortly define what bioplastics are because um, the term is still really in, ill-defined. Um, so bioplastics include on one hand, bio-based materials, which are made from re renewable feedstocks as for example, biopolyethylene. They also comprise um, biodegradable materials, which are um, supposed to degrade naturally. An example here is poly polybutylated succinate, um, BPS. And the term also covers bio-based and biodegradable materials, so which are both, for example, polylactic acids. Um, and according to European bioplastics, the term also covers similar materials on the markets, um, such as starch plants. Um, but currently it's, it's unclear whether these plant-based materials, which are often blends with synthetic materials, fall under that category. But in either way, um, they are used um, to fulfill the same function as plastics and appear to thus, uh, as, that, as such to the consumer. So um, in our study, we were analyzing all these nine different um, plastic materials you can see here on the bottom. And um, what we did is we um, acquired in total 43 products and products in raw materials in the German supermarkets, we cut those products and we extracted all the chemicals contained in them um, with a solvent. And these so-called extracts, um, we applied them on one hand to non-targeted chemical analysis in order to characterize the chemicals found in there. And on the other hand, we applied them to four different in vitro bioassays to analyze for unspecific endpoints and endocrine activities. And that's what we found. Um, our study demonstrated that bioplastic and plant-based materials contain a large number and variety of chemicals. So in 80% of the samples, we identified more than 1000 chemicals. And in individual products, we found up to 20,000 chemicals. Um, now we tried to identify those compounds, but just a subset of them, just the priority compounds, it was just way too many. And um, there were chemicals which are used as monomers, oligomers, we found additive, lubricants, and non-intentionally added substances. So as you can imagine, this chemical complexity really represents a challenge for the risk assessment since the classical one-on-one -on -one approach does not work. And one alternative to that is um, to do whole migrate toxicity ex um, testing by applying them to in vitro bioassays, for example, and that's uh, what we did. 
Um, so we assessed the toxicity of the whole extract. And this, um, there we, 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 um, we observed that the majority of the products um, and in total with 76% um, contain chemicals which were toxic in, in vitro. And I show you an example here, which is um, baseline toxicity. And don't be overwhelmed by this um, big plot, I lead you through that. So basically what you can see is that all that every column represents one product um, here um, and the length of the column um, represents the effect strength and they are sorted um, by the different material types. And as indicated by the um, blue columns here, most or the cellulose and starch based product and use a really strong baseline toxicity. On the other hand, really few of the bio PE based samples had an effect. Um, let's move on and see um, the other endpoints. Um, they are summarized here in this heat map. So here's the different endpoints and that's all the different samples. And um, they are shown here as a gradient from green, which is a comparable low or no toxicity to red, which is a comparable really high toxicity. And that's the baseline toxicity here I was just talking about. And you can see there's a lot of red, so a lot of samples were with high toxicity. With regards to an oxidative stress induction, there were samples of um, a lot of the different material types that induced oxidative stress. Um, coming to endocrine, endocrine crying activity, um, we did not re observe any estrogenicity since this is all green here. But on the other hand, a lot of the samples were antiandrogenic, which means they inhibited the um, um, effect of testosterone. Um, so what that shows us is that um, a lot of the product contain toxic chemicals and that it really depends on, on the individual product, whether that was the case or not. And it does, did not so much depend on the material type itself, since that picture is really diverse here. And coming again to the, the chemicals, so 30% of the features was um, present in my maximum of three samples. Or to say it another way around, um, half um, of um, the chemicals which were found, for example, in one of the 10 PLA products were not found in the other nine PLA products. Um, so as you can see again, every product has a really individual chemical composition and toxicity. Um, in the next step, we compared these results to the results of our previous study to the conventional plastic, which we um, analyzed in exactly the same way. And that demonstrated then tox that toxicologically bio-based and biodegradable materials are not any better. Um, what you can see here is the different endpoints again. And here's the sample with activity for the different endpoints, when, whether it's conventional or bio-based plastics. And as you can see, these um, columns have nearly the same height, um, indicating um, that the percentage of products with toxicity is comparable between conventional and bioplastics. Um, the same was true for the effect strength, um, shown here exemplary for, um, the, for baseline toxicity. Each dot represents one product and the red line is the mean. And this, the red lines are um, again nearly um, on similar heights. And, and what is really well illustrated here that it rather depends on the product itself, how toxic it is. So they spread across um, different effect levels here. And it's not so much dependent whether it's in a conventional or a bioplastic. So um, to, to sum up here, um, the chemical safety is not always guaranteed for all of our products and thus it needs to be more considered in the design of materials. So that was um, the part um, with regards to uh, our recent publication and our research. Now I try to give you a, a broader picture and um, 
and present you some opportunities and challenges of um, bio-based and biodegradable materials. Um, so a uh, um, current um, important task for um, plastic companies is to design um, more sustainable uh, materials and to minimize the environmental impact and the greenhouse gas emission. And one really prominent um, solution update, um, option here are bio-based and biodegradable materials. However, although they have a lot of advantages, um, they are not without any environmental impacts. And I give you some examples here. So looking at um, bio-based materials, they have the advantage that they save um, non-renewable resources by using um, crops um, as resource. But also crop growing is not without any environmental impact, especially if grown in monocultures or if a lot of pesticides are used. And then there also exists the concern that crop growing for that um, application might compete with food um, production. And another example um, is that um, biodegradable materials promise to degrade naturally. However, biodegradability largely de depends on the environmental conditions. And these are not always met. So for instance, um, biodegradable products are not long enough in the um, composting facility um, such that they break down completely or the, um, the temperatures at our home composts are not high enough. And especially if they are littered in the terrestrial, terrestrial or aquatic environment, they often break, don't break down under the um, conditions there. Um, so as you can see, there is a lot of challenges already. And now with our study, we added another challenge and that's the aspect of chemical safety. I don't want to draw a too negative picture here on the bio-based and biodegradable materials since they have really um, advantages, but I rather want to point out um, that an, uh, our perfect material has to meet a lot of requirements and so it has to be chemically safe and environmentally sound. And, and in the attempt to uh, fulfill these requirements, a lot of challenges are arising. But um, good news is that there are um, solution options available. Um, and I give you some examples um, here as well. So with regards to the chemical safety, in order um, to produce um, or to, yeah, um, non-toxic uh, materials, chemical um, aspects of chemical safety should be more included in regulations and considered in frameworks as, as for example, life cycles assessments, LCA, where they're currently disregarded. And another option is, um, or additionally, um, the chemical complexity should be reduced by only authorizing a subset of chemicals or polymers or um, by whitelists. Um, and on a positive note, as our study showed as well, um, is that there are non-toxic products already available on the market. So they can serve as, as best practice example in the design of new and non-toxic materials. However, in order to do so, the chemical composition needs to be made um, transparent. And, or yeah, they had, had, uh, the companies have to outline how um, or what ingredients their materials have. And this transparency is currently largely missing. Um, additionally, to, in order to assess the safety of our materials, we need new principles, as for example, to test the whole migrate of the end product. Um, coming again to our bio-based and biodegradable materials. Um, so, in order to um, reduce the ecological footprint of bio-based materials, residues of food production can be used, or we can try to use less fertilizers. Um, a general advantage which these materials have is that they can be recycled with their petroleum-based counterparts. For example, we can recycle bio-based um, polyethylene with 
petroleum-based polyethylene. And last but not least, um, for the biodegradable materials, at the current state, um, we could think about use them only for certain applications, as for example, where um, biodegradability is part of the function. That would be, um, for instance, in medicine, when they should carry an active ingredient. On the other hand, they can be used if environmental entry cannot be avoided, as for example, for agricultural films or for fishing nets. Um, additionally, um, we would need um, to improve our certification here and have to have one standardized comprehensive um, certification. Um, okay, so um, coming to an end. The, our, the perfect material has to fulfill really complex requirements. And these requirements are accompanied by complex challenges, such that at least at the current stage, a one-size-fits-all solution seems to be really unlikely. Thus, the choice of the right material might also always depend on the application and the scope one has. However, we won't save our um, or we don't achieve complete sustainability or won't um, solve our waste problem by just replacing one material by another, like conventional plastic by bioplastics. Um, but at the same time, we also try to need um, to change our behavior or our way of consumption. So for example, by minimizing our, um, our use of materials, and at the other hand, to reuse the resources we are already using by um, moving from a linear to a circular economy. Okay, so um, I hope now you are all um, really expert on bioplastics and um, I'm looking forward to, to a discussion later on. <laughs>